Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. Hey guys, Robert here. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer. During our recording, Tony's dog was happily snoring away during the entire episode. That is the noise you hear throughout. But today is a great show here on Mushing Radio. Let's kick it off. Radio Free Palmer, 89.5 KVRF, presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and you're listening to Mushing Radio here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site. You can find all of our episodes over on DogWorksRadio.com and be sure to check us out on social media. Search for DogWorks Radio. And I am joined by my co-host Tony Ryder calling in from Kenai, Alaska. Tony, how's it going today? going really well. I'm going to apologize now if you hear any dogs barking. I'm pug sitting for my parents, so I've got two very wild, rambunctious dogs who know that I'm busy for the next half hour, so they're going to get to do whatever they want. Well, we are a dog podcast, so do- barking dogs is, <laughs> is okay, as, as, uh, as they say. So we have an interesting show today. It is the middle of summer, and it is definitely hot. By Alaska standards mm-hmm. here in the Matsu Valley, and I'm sure down on the uh, Kenai Peninsula. I think we're in the 80s up here. What's it like down there? Um, you know, I think it got up to 70 over in Soldatna, but here in Kenai, since we're right on the water, um, we have a really nice breeze. I think we're mid-60s, which is a heck of a lot nicer than 80 degrees, so I'll take it. And it is the dog days of summer for the sled dogs. At least our sled dogs are uh, basking in the sun and uh, gain a little bit of weight in the off season. That's what a lot of sled dogs do. And and unless they're working on glaciers or tours or something like that, most of them have most of the summer off because it's a little bit too warm to be running sled dogs. A good rule of thumb uh, from a musher's perspective is, is if it's below 50 degrees or low humidity, is sort of that uh, that sweet spot to take your dogs out. And unless you want to run at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, in these summer days, uh, we will not see those temperatures in the daytime until late August, early September for sure. So with that and the heat of summer, just this past weekend was the Iditarod Volunteer Picnic and Sign-Ups. I know that you attended, and it was not what you expected it was a pretty small turnout wasn't it it was small it was quiet um a lot of the pomp and circumstance uh didn't happen normally there's a little more um excitement where they announce like the teacher on the trail and um you know there's a lot of hype and really there weren't a lot of people on the microphone talking or giving speeches which, I mean, isn't a huge deal. Nobody really wants to listen to somebody pontificate. Um, but it just felt a little different in that way. And then, um, yeah, the turnout was really small. Not a lot of mushers signed up in person. Um, and not a lot of volunteers came out. I don't know. I'm sure it's a combination of things. You know, I mean, I spent over $100 just getting there and back. Um, gas wise. So I'm sure economy had a lot to do with it, as well as the fact that y'all promised us that it was going to be a scorching hot, sunny day. And so I, that might have kept some people away. I dressed for 80 degrees. And I don't even think it got up past like 65 there. It was foggy and cold the whole time during the picnic. Um, but yeah, so it was still a a good time. I got to hang out with quite a few of my Iditarod friends that I only see twice a year. And, um, I actually got to spend a lot of time chatting with, uh, Jeff Schultz, who is my photography hero, which, uh, if you've followed me on social media, you know, I have a little bit of a 
fangirl obsession with Jeff. So that was a lot of fun. Um, because it was so quiet, Jeff was actually able to mingle and chat with friends and with fans instead of having to just take a bunch of musher portraits um, like he typically does. So uh, it, it, it was a little different. I wouldn't say it was horrible or bad. It was just very different and it kind of felt like a change in the tide from what we've experienced in the last 50 years of Iditarod, uh, it does feel like maybe things are changing um, as far as who we're going to see in the race in the future. So uh, a little bit of uncertainty, which this uh, person here does not like change. So it, it was a little unsettling that way. But um, for the most part, it was good. The food was good and there was a lot of it because they were expecting a lot more people. So. Overall, it wasn't too bad. Well, let's talk a little bit about the turnout. You had mentioned that uh, the economy may have something to do with it. And I know that we've talked a lot on this show, especially Alex and I. Alex Stein, my co-host for many years, mm -hmm. uh, talked about sort of the future of mushing. And economy was one of the things that we always talked about. And we're definitely seeing that as we speak, not only with gas prices, but dog food and groceries mm -hmm. and everything that uh, that you and I spend our money on. Of course, uh, the dog mushers and volunteers have to spend that on as well. One thing of note is airfare. And I know that a lot of volunteers in particular, mm -hmm. uh, they have a teacher conference right before uh, the picnic. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, neighbor right up the street, Vern Halter, typically does that. He ha usually has a heck of a turnout for that. But I was looking at airfares just this morning, Tony, and typically you can fly one way to Seattle for mm -hmm. about $100. And uh, yep. that, that could be a red-eye flight, but it's it's pretty good, $100, $125. I was looking for tickets in August and the cheapest ticket I could find was $491. So almost mm -hmm. five times more than the typical flight to Anchorage. That is insane, isn't it? It is, yeah. You know, um, I've noticed that uh, looking at different travel options for me, it's cheap to go down, but coming back home is where it's really expensive. So I can imagine... Um, you know, mushers, certainly the ones that were out of state, they said that they weren't coming to the picnic because they could not afford to fly up. Um, and I'm sure it was the same thing for volunteers with the cost of everything at home going up. Vacations, uh, you know, are going to be uh, something that you have to prioritize and you can't just take a weekend jaunt to Alaska to go hang out with some smelly dog mushers for a few hours. So, um, yeah, you know, that, that I think had a lot to do with it. And I know that, um, as the day progressed and the, the list of mushers signing up, wasn't getting all that, um, much bigger either online or in person. Um, one of the mushers, Karen Hendrickson, she wasn't signing up to run, but she said, she just happened to mention to the ladies at the sign-in table, she said she knew that at least five kennels that were getting out of um, even recreation mushing, that they were going to have to sell uh, their kennel off um, because it was just getting too expensive to properly care for and feed the dogs. And it's not fair to the dogs to, to have them uh, go through this financial uncertainty because it's not their fault. You know, we're here to take care of them. So, um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I don't think anybody really anticipated um, the economy going the way that it has in the last year and a half. And uh, so I think a lot of these uh, unknowns are not something that was totally predictable happening so fast, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely something to keep paying attention to, uh, especially for these smaller kennels. And and let's talk one more second about the economy before we jump into the picnic. I know that you follow these guys a lot closer than I do on social media. Have any of the tour um, mushing operations voiced any concern about uh, lack of tourists or whatever mm -hmm. this year because of the economy or, or is it pretty much the same? You know, I, I haven't seen anything like that. I know that um, when I was in Seward visiting the uh, CV kennel 
touring kennel to do some updated photos for for their promotional stuff. Um, they they had a great turnout while I was there for both of the tours uh, that I was there for, um, but they've also cut back on, I think, the number of tours and everything just with the uncertainty. But Seward is also one of those big hubs for the tourism uh, industry here in Alaska. So I think they're better off than some of the other ones that are maybe in the interior or not in a cruise ship port. Um, I know that that was a concern last year for uh, the failures, um, but I did not get brave enough to actually ask Liz or, or Matthew um, how things were going this year with their, their tour company. Um, they did for the uh, raffle, which everybody gets a ticket, your name gets, you're not your name, but your name gets put in a, uh, or your ticket gets put in a, a big old tub and they pull out numbers and uh, they did uh, donate two of their tours for um, for the uh, the volunteer drawings. So um, I assume things are going well enough that they feel comfortable giving those out. Um, but yeah, no, you know, I think I think tourism in Alaska is up um, exponentially, is what they said on the news from the last few years. So I think. They're doing. They're probably doing pretty good, but it it it's an unknown. I haven't seen anybody complaining. So let's talk about the signups. Uh, uh, you said twenty one folks signed mm-hmm. up. Before we jump into who signed up, you also mentioned that this. You feel that it's a little bit of a change uh, because they have the option of signing up online, and then they're if they get it in on time or whatever. It's considered that first day sign up, and I know that Brent Sass signed up online. And as as you said at the beginning of the show, or right before we went on air, he is the only defending champ so far that has signed up. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, there's no other um, former Iditarod champions in the list. We know that Dallas Seavey said that he was taking time off. He's got a daughter getting ready to enter her teen years. And he wants to be very involved in that. Um, your Life Sounds Olsum uh, posted on Saturday uh, during the picnic um, that he is also taking time off from long distance racing. He's not taking full off from any races, um, but he wants to spend time with his family. Um, uh, he is a new dad uh, as of earlier this year, last year, uh, late last year. Um, so that's, that's something that's very important to him. And a lot of mushers have actually taken a step back to be, um, more involved with their kids. Um, but your did say that he's also going to focus on the elusive, uh, Cusquim 300 win. Um, so, you know, he's not getting out of racing fully, uh, but he did sell off most of his main Iditarod team. And it sounds like he has mostly young dogs and puppies. So I don't expect Yor to be in the mix in the next few years. Um, Thomas Warner, of course, he's over in Norway where uh, dog mushing is a rock and roll sport. Almost, it almost feels like NFL level. Um, So, you know, I don't think there's as much incentive for him to spend all of that money to come over here and defend, um, especially since, you know, he had that, horrible time getting back home after he won during the uh the first wave of the pandemic so i'm sure until everybody gets their act together with covid he's not wanting to repeat uh 2020 so it it does feel like a changing of the guard you don't have jeff king you don't have martin boozer signed up you don't have mitch cv signed up um so yeah it's it's really brent to defend. There's no other Iditarod champion signed up or, or even really vocal about getting on board. So I'm, it's, it's kind of an unknown. It's, it's a little weird to see an almost Yukon quest size roster for the Iditarod right now. So Tony, do you have the list uh, handy? I do. So can you read off the names since it's such a small list and we keep saying small because <laughs> last year I believe they had well over 40, which is pretty typical mm-hmm. for 
uh, that first uh, wave of signups uh, at the picnic and then right after. So we have uh, less than half of that. So can you read off all the names for us? Sure, we have, and I'm reading it off of their um, Musher picture list, so it's going to be in alphabetical order, not in sign-up order. But uh, we have Travis Fields, Anna and Christy Barrington, Grayson Bruton, uh, Eddie Burke Jr., Katie Jo Dieter, Richie Deal, Riley Dyche, Matt Saylor, Jay Fouché, Matt Hall, Jesse Holmes, Dan Caduce, Hunter Keith, Eric Kelly, Jason Mackey, Nicholas Petit, um, Milla Porcelled, Ryan Reddington, Brent Sass, and Bridget Buckin. And right off the top of my head, is Jay and uh, Eddie the only two rookies? I guess Katie Joe because she didn't finish last year. So just right. those three, is that right? Um, and Bridget Watkins, because she also had to scratch during that windstorm uh, at the final leg of Iditarod this year. She was the one that uh, ended up uh, being one of the, the life flighted ones out because she broke her collarbone, I believe. So. Right, right. And one of the traditions at the Iditarod picnic, and, and one of the main reasons why a lot of these guys show up is at the end of the picnic, they have a drawing for uh, the um, the entry fee is is waived. Of course, you have to pay for it first. You have to write a check and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and put it in the pot, so to speak, before they draw these. But they had uh, two this year. And there's an interesting parallel I saw on Facebook. Uh, it, they, they had a picture <laughs> that said... Um, uh, turning heads and seeing double. I thought that was pretty cool yep. uh, uh, of a way to describe that. So, so with that, who is the um, who are the mushers that got the free entries? Christy Barrington was the first one drawn. Uh, she's of course from Seeing Double Kennel, which she runs with her twin sister Anna, hence the Seeing Double. Um, and then Travis Beals from Turning Heads Kennel. Uh, won his entry fee back. And I did miss one of our rookies. We also have Hunter Keith, who's uh, running one of the Reddington teams this year. Uh, he's also running his rookie race. So five uh, rookies. Yeah, Trav. F five rookies. Five rookies, yeah. Yeah, yeah, five rookies. So right now it's a, it's a really huge ratio of rookies. Um, but yeah, no, Travis and, and Christy, they, they shared a high five and, uh, they got their entry fees back, which was kind of fun. And yeah, I, I had to caption that picture, just, you know, turning heads and seeing, or seeing double and turning heads. It, it just was such a funny little play on words. Oh, that was your picture, your caption that said that. It was, okay. it was. <laughs> Very good. So also. I'll take credit. Uh, yes. Also, you had mentioned that, uh, two other mushers, got their entry fees waived. Who were they and why was that? Sure. Um, Matthew Failer and Dan Caduce both uh, had their entry fees waived. Um, Matthew Failer, people may remember one most inspirational because he had to take down the very aggressive moose on the trail and then had to, uh, of course, dress out the moose uh, before continuing on the race. Um, he protected quite a few teams that we're dealing with that. Um, and my understanding is Matthew's not a hunter. He'd never dressed out a moose before. So kudos to Matthew. And then Dan won uh, for humanitarian award. He ran the race, came in fourth this last year uh, with all 14 dogs that he started with, which is kind of unheard of. Um, I think the the highest team had been Jesse Royer, who broke top 10 when it was still a team of 16 dogs. But Dan made it into fourth and almost came in third. I think if he had pushed just a little bit harder, he could have uh, kept Jesse Holmes in, back behind him. But uh, so they both also came in. It was really funny. Matthew came right up to the table. and He's like, all right, I don't actually have to pay because, you know, I, I won most inspirational, not to brag or anything. I just want to make sure I don't have to pay today. So um, really kind of fun to, to celebrate that. And it's not something that I think a lot of us think about right off the top of the bat that, oh yeah, by the way, these guys won these awards and, and they're also now entered basically into the Iditarod. So. 
Uh, one other quick story about Matt Failer. I saw on his page, his wife, Liz, posted a picture of an Emmy mm-hmm. that they received uh, for her reporting during the 2020 Iditarod and a documentary or just the news coverage of that. Do you know any more about that? Uh, it was for the 2021 Iditarod, the, the gold loop uh, the trail, short one, yes. which was, yeah, the shorter one, the the loop that kept getting shorter because weather and trail conditions didn't let them actually go to the flats like they wanted to. Um, yeah, she, the, um, the whole team of Iditarod Insider won for the documentary, the DVD that uh, came out after that race. And uh, she was very excited at the picnic. I don't know. I don't remember her actually saying that um, she was getting her own award, but yeah, they posted on Facebook a picture of the Emmy Award with her name on it. So it's sitting right there next to his most inspirational award and all of, uh, I think, his his Cuscoquim win championship plaque. Um, so it's something that the kennel is very proud of, and they should be. I think Liz is an amazing addition to Insider. She um, is able to stay with the middle and back of the pack a lot more than Greg and uh, Bruce ever do. Um, she has a really good connection being involved in the dog mushing world, not just during I did a rod, but, um, throughout the year. So she has a great insight. She has uh, fresh energy. She asks questions that fans want to know. She's got her pulse on what fans are asking. And so she tries to bring that into her coverage. She is of course a professional, uh, news reporter. She worked for KTVA before it got, um, bought out by KTUU. So she's, she's got the experience. Um, she's got the energy and the drive and, and I really, really, really hope insider keeps her around because she's a huge asset. And I think she is one of the main reasons why they deserve the Emmy. So one other quick story about the picnic, and that was the absence of Rob Erbach. Uh, You had said that uh, there was a COVID concern with that. Uh, What do you know about Mm -hmm. that? I'm going to do a little bit of a parallel with other professional sports. Sure. So um, it was a noted absence since Rob took over as CEO Um, He's always been at the picnic, even his very first one, which he had just been hired. So he had really no clue what to expect or um, who any of us were, be it fans, volunteers or or mushers. Um, But he was very enthusiastic and gung ho and gave a a really nice presentation of himself and what he hoped for the future of Iditarod, which did not include Iditacoin at the time. Um, but, uh, he was absent from, from the picnic this year and, uh, there was, you know, some talk and, and concern people noticed, um, again, because he is just such a vibrant, uh, personality at the picnic, um, and every I did her out event, really, he's, he's very noticeable because of his energy. Um, but I did find out today that, um, it had something to do with COVID. I don't know if it meant that he had COVID, if someone in his family had COVID, if he didn't want to travel because of COVID, I'm not sure. Um, but he was unable to come to the picnic for that. Um, as well as, uh, Mark Nordman was also not there. Normally he's grilling up his salmon, uh, at the picnic, but he also had some, uh, health related issues. It wasn't because he was boycotting the picnic or anything like that, which some people had posted that they believed that he was just too scared to come to the picnic. And that's not true. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to Mark Nordman, our, our race marshal, who does an excellent job in dealing with all of our mushing and volunteer personalities. So. And do you know, Tony, if either one of those guys uh, lives outside of Alaska or, or are they residents here? I'm pretty sure Mark is a full-time resident. I'm not sure about Rob. Okay. So I had mentioned that uh, we're going to relay that to another professional sport. And if if you're a longtime listener, you know, I always bring up how the Iditarod is becoming like a lot of other professional sports here in America. Uh, Just this past week, uh, the Stanley Cup was held for us hockey fans. And one of the big deals, of course, at the end of the Stanley Cup, the winner receives the Stanley Cup. And for 
as long as I can remember the commissioner is there and the commissioner of the NFL, his name is Gary Bettman. He is typically the guy that's out there to hand over the Stanley cup to the captain of, of the, of the team that went one. And that's the Colorado avalanche this year, but he was noticeably absent. And of course that uh, struck a chord on Twitter as it always does amongst fans. And uh, we found out in the broadcast that uh, he has, the same um, health concerns as Rob Erbach did. I don't know if he had COVID or his family or whatever, but that is a, a very a quick parallel between the two professional sports. And I say that because COVID stuff is still on the front of the minds of a lot of things, including I did a lot of course and NHL and NFL and travel and everything else, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And it, it kind of um, brings up the point of, you know, what are we looking at um, for the race next year? I know that, you know, there were several mushers that did not race in the 50th, even though they wanted to because of the COVID requirements um, for the, the um, mushers had to be vaccinated. The volunteers had to be vaccinated. The officials had to be vaccinated. And that was mainly due to the concerns of some of the villages that they were going to be visiting. They did not want outsiders coming in, bringing in the virus. Um, and so I, it, it'll be interesting to see. And I wonder if that's maybe why some of the mushers aren't signed up yet. They're waiting for the, the new set of rules to come out to see if that vaccination requirement is still there or if that's going to be relaxed. Um, I assume at some point in the race's future that the vaccination won't be required again. I don't know if that's going to be in 2023, though, um, especially if, you know, our officials are still de dealing with it themselves. It's going to be forefront in their mind when they go to make the, uh, the policies and the rules for the upcoming race. So before we switch gears, anything else on the picnic or any other news relating to it? You know, I just had to laugh. I, I stood uh, around the sign-up table for most of the, the afternoon. That's where most of my friends hang out. And that's also where I can kind of keep tabs on who's signing up, who's there at the picnic, because I'm not going to go around and talk to people, but I'm also always going to try and eavesdrop. And Katie Jo Dieter came up and um, the first thing that everyone asked was, oh, is Jeff signing up too? And she said, no, he's coming with the credit card though. Um, so Jeff paid for her entry fee, but she, uh, she did mention that, you know, she was looking forward to finishing the race, hoping that, you know, the storm, the wind wasn't as bad as what she did. You know, she heard all last year that, it's never this windy. It's always really windy, but it's never this bad. Um, and so she she mentioned that, you know, she's going to be kind of upset with all of the first-time rookies if, if the weather does uh, go back to normal and not have that freak uh, windstorm that they dealt with this last year. Um, because she's like, I'm going to feel like everybody else gets to do this their first time, and it's just normal. <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, so, you know, just fun stuff like that. Christy Barrington and Andy Poole, before they even came uh, to sign up for the race, they rode by on their tandem bikes. So there were just a lot of random moments that only happen at the Iditarod picnic. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people missed out. There weren't as many uh, old time mushers there, but I feel like, you know, we don't always necessarily need them if we are looking at a changing of the guard and a change of tide, then maybe some of these other mushers that are just recently retiring or just taking a break, like Karen Hendrickson, just come on out and have a good time. Eat some free food. We all love you. So maybe next year we'll, we'll have a bigger turnout. All right. And for fans that are listening on the podcast, you're going to get a, a another portion of this of this show. Whereas the, uh, the guys that are listening on KVRF, they're going to miss out on this, uh, <laughs> breaking news that, uh, that I found out about. And we sent out a Facebook message or a Facebook post on Facebook and Twitter this afternoon that says, Hey, we're, we're recording tonight. Does anybody have any topics that they would like us to discuss? And one of our fans mentioned that they would like us to talk about, 
the Idita coin and sort of its um, its uh, its news, if you will, where it sits as we as we talk, because they released it right after I did a rod, and uh, <laughs> that was really the only question that came up, and I posted that relatively late, but I was reading through uh, through the internet today to try to find something new, and you had mentioned, Tony, that uh, they have a Zoom meeting for the Iditarod membership, and that's, of course, anybody that signs up to be a member, uh, that's where their quote-unquote breaking news happens or updates or pats on the back or whatever, so we may get an update then, but the earliest story or latest story that I found was was right after it was released, and I did not know this, but they call it the Iditaverse. Are you familiar with mm-hmm. that before I jump into this? You know, I saw something about it. I didn't realize it was part of the Idita coin. I thought it was just their new thing. You know, they've tried out Iditarod Nation as their hashtag. I thought maybe instead of going with an NFL reference, because it sounded so much like Raider Nation, which as a 49er fan, I just had to kind of roll my eyes and try not to gag. But um, <laughs> um when I saw the I did a verse, I just thought that maybe that was their next thing. They were trying to jump on like the Avengers with the whole, uh, you know, met- metaverse or whatever it's called. Um, it just I, so I didn't really pay attention to it. Um, I, I think some of these <laughs> some of these catchphrases that they're trying just aren't working out. <laughs> so so let's talk a little bit about this. I know that we talked about this during our I did a rod coverage and. I was all on board for this at the time, and that's about three and a half <laughs> months or so ago. The Iditaco- the Iditaverse is actually two different things. So let's talk a little bit about that, because I think it's an important subject that we should talk about, because uh, you sort of put it out there that we may be seeing a change of the guard, and not only with mushers, but also how they raise money. And, and this could potentially be, good, bad, or indifferent, two ways that they do it. The first initiative is called the Idita coin, and that's very similar to Bitcoin. That is uh, sort of a cryptocurrency that a person can buy and it can raise and lower as if it's very similar to like owning stock. Uh, so they have that that is still on pre-sale, and it's been on pre-sale since it was released back in March. Mm-hmm. Uh, you cannot buy it on uh, the um, uh, cryptocurrency apps like uh, Coinbase or anything like that. It's only through the Iditarod website or whatever they've set up for that. But they're intending to use the Idita coin to generate funding for staging the race, as well as animal welfare grants and financial support for rural communities along the trail. Now, the pre-sale, as we mentioned, it's supposed to be about half price of the launch price, which is a good deal if you're into cryptocurrency. And I just got involved in some cryptocurrency about the same time. And uh, boy, I tell you what, Tony, I bought some regular old Bitcoin and I've really taken a hit. (laughs) <laughs> over over the last few months. But as they say in the stock market, uh, it comes with longevity. So we'll see if it bounces back. So that is I did a coin. So it's a little bit more controlled. The other one is called an NFT. And I'm sure if folks are anywhere prevalent uh, uh, with uh, sort of the comings and goings with With internet and technology, you've heard of NFTs before. We talked about um, the NHL a second ago, and let's talk a little bit about the Super Bowl. During the Super Bowl, there was a commercial on, Mm -hmm. and it was all it was was a bouncing QCR code. That's all it was. And of course, people uh, love the Super Bowl commercials, they pay millions and millions of dollars for these. But all it was was a bouncing QCR code. Of course, the goal was to to get the millions of people watching it to click uh, their their cameras on that and, of course, check it out. And that was for an NFT. It's called a non-fudgeable token. And I know that these are (laughs) everywhere. You can even set one up on your Twitter profile 
and uh, you can earn money if you do so. I don't know who would want to earn money from my profile picture or your profile picture <laughs> or anybody else's, but I guess you can do it. But the, the idea behind an NFT, it's not like Bitcoin. It's not like the idea of coin, but it's, it's, a, it's like a piece of art, a piece of digital art. So if you have this on Twitter or through uh, the Iditarod, technically... Uh, you could buy it for X dollars, and then at some point, somebody could buy that from you for Y dollars, and of course, hopefully, <laughs> make money from that. Uh, and that's their intention with the um, with the NFT. And their NFT, according to the to the news release, bears the Iditarod's 50th anniversary logo. So they're banking on that 50th anniversary logo as being worth some money and they also intend to use the um the nft to raise money for animal welfare and of course staging the race now we talked about rob urbach and he's he's kind of a mover and a shaker and he talked about doing a whole bunch of different things and it's going to be the iditarod of the future i know that you're a little bit against this because it's definitely different from you know, it's definitely not your grandpa's Iditarod, as they say. I think that's a, a Lincoln commercial or a Buick commercial or something. They say this is not your uh, Oldsmobile. They say this is not your grandfather's Oldsmobile. So it's <laughs> definitely not your grandpa's Iditarod, but this could be the wave of the future. So I know that you're apprehensive. Tell us about it. Yeah, you know, I... I I think, you know, listening to the different volunteers and fans that were at the picnic, I did a coin was kind of the, the butt of the joke, um, like a lot of people said, um, and I think I've even made this argument, you need to know your audience, and it's not like dog mushing is chock full of money, it's not like, um, you know, the fans that really follow it are into investing in new currency or technology um, because we also don't have a lot of money. And, and that was a big thing that also tied into their partnership with um, the new merchandise that's all so outrageously priced that, you know, nobody's buying the stuff anymore. <laughs> we can't afford it. It's, it's very much um, cruise ship prices um, is how someone put it uh, on Saturday. And it kind of feels that same way with I did a coin and uh, the NFT, which, you know, first of all, you need people to actually understand it, especially, again, the Iditarod audience, not a lot of tech savvy people, not a lot of um, people willing to throw money at something they don't understand. Um, and so the, the kind of shrug from from Rob and others where it's like, well, it's I did a coin, you know, it's, it's I did a rod. So just support it. It isn't really enough. There isn't a lot of trust right now in I did a rod and there hasn't been. That's why Rob got hired in the first place was because there was a lot of trust lost by, uh, by the original or the former board and uh, leadership of the race. So while I applaud him for trying to do new things and get more interest and get the, the hip new young crowd, um, it, it doesn't always come off sounding like they're listening or that they even really know who's participating. Um, even I, I know that's a big thing with even the uh, newer fans that came through from like the ugly dogs who are very tech savvy. Uh, as we know, because they did come from the social media tech uh, side of things. Um, th a lot of them are not fans. I know if I did a coin, but they're also, they also are feeling just like the old timers are that nobody's really listening at Iditarod. Um, and, and that's something that I've gotten all weekend. I, I should have, I should have let you know this before we even went on air was um, I've gotten a lot of messages from people I don't know, I've never met, I've never really interacted with them online. Um, and yet it, every one of them is like, look, you know, if you have any pull, Tony, with, with Iditarod, you need to let them know that we're not happy because, you know, we've written letters, we've written emails, and we're not even getting a response, even a generated response of, hey, thanks for your letter, you know. 
Um, and so it was, it was kind of overwhelming on Saturday and Sunday when uh, apparently I was the only one on Saturday posting pictures um, or tweeting out information or even posting on Facebook information. Um, it, it, it's like Iditarod's kind of lost its way with its fans um, is how I'm hearing from other fans. Um, it, it's, I think I did a, I think I did a coin and this is a whole rant that was nothing to do with your question, but, um, I think I did a coin just kind of has alienated a lot of the fan base in that it, it's another sign that, you know, I did a not really in tune with, with what the fan base wants and what the, the, um, the, the established, uh, fan base is used to. And that's not necessarily a bad thing to be different. You know, I don't think Rob is completely wrong to try and, and make Iditarod come into the 21st century or the 22nd century. I don't even know what century we want to try and jump into. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really don't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know where I did it. I don't know where Bitcoin falls into. Is it 21st century or are we looking ahead to the future? I, I, th um, I think it's right now for sure. Um, so, right. so can I ask a couple of questions? Uh, and and sure. by far, Tony, I am am not a cryptocurrency expert. As I mentioned, I've, I've been dabbling. <laughs> you know in more it. than I do. Yes, so I, you are the expert tonight. <laughs> yes, I, I've been dabbling in it. By I I am late to the game by a heck of a long shot for sure. But I have a couple of questions. Or actually, first a statement and then a question. Uh, Tony, I believe that uh, that you're a little bit younger than me, but definitely not uh, the the uh, Gen early Gen or late Gen, Gen Zers who are really embracing this mm -hmm. cryptocurrency. I mean, they're paying for Ubers and Uber Eats and Grubhub and DoorDashes and all sorts of things with cryptocurrency because it's very similar to if you're paying with PayPal, which is technically a cryptocurrency if you do receive a paypal payment and you're paying somebody else with paypal it's sort of a cryptocurrency but you're technically spending your money to put it into your um into your paypal account so i guess the uh the late gen zers are are definitely uh, embracing it which may or may not be the future of Iditarod fandom. I don't know. I, I'm sure that you probably know more than me. But my question is, are, are you familiar? We're going to go back to the other professional sports, and we're going to talk about the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers yeah. are the only publicly traded NFL team, and they're publicly traded uh, through stocks, meaning if you're a fan of the Green Bay Packers, you can buy uh, stock in the Green Bay Packers that earn a very, very small percentage of the team. And I guess that gives you a little bit of a say or a little bit of a, a uh, you know, pat on the back or whatever it gives you, a certificate to hang on the wall that says you're an owner of the Green Bay Packers. How do you see that this is different than that? Because people love that idea with uh, with the Green Bay Packers and and what they do. Uh, that's a good question. You know, I kind of feel like that's what we get with the ITC membership, and we used to actually get a whole lot more than what we do now for the same amount that we pay. Um, but you know, it used to be that anybody could be an ITC member, and that meant that you got one vote during the annual ITC member meeting. Now we don't get that boat. Um, we do get a little card and we get a 10% discount in the uh, the gift shop, which we also got before. Um, and yeah, and I've been going through, uh, if you followed me on social media at all, you've seen that I've been going through my grandparents stuff and I've come across uh, where they used to get certificates and you know, you are a member, you are an I did a rod trail committee member. That means something. Congratulations. Um, so very similar, I think, to what you're talking about with the um, the Green Bay Packers. If that's where they're going with I did a coin, I think that might help with the younger fan base, but they need to actually have a younger fan base. And I'm not sure that they're reaching that just yet. Um, you know, they're, they're sporadic with their um, social media. 
they are um, they're not really engaging anything younger. They're really not doing anything different with their PR. Um, like I said, they're trying out these different hashtags like Iditarod Nation, um, which doesn't get half the traction of stuff that other people have come up with, whether it be Musher Twitter or um, other hashtags. So, you know, and then you had the whole issue this year with a lot of fans feeling like there wasn't enough transparency. So not only are they not really getting the younger generation, which, by the way, I'm a geriatric millennial, according to the latest, greatest terminology. I am not anywhere close to Gen Z. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's <laughs> let's not use me too much here. Um, is that Gen, is that you Gen know, Y? Is that what you guys are called? I don't know. I, I I don't know what we are really. I'm like, we're in between everything. I was born in 85. So it, it really, we don't really have a cool name. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> continue on. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're talking not about, a problem. You're talking about the, the but, younger. Yeah. You know, they don't really have, I'm not seeing a younger fan base. Like you don't have like my generation of fan. I think a lot of us grew up, you know, we had not only Susan Butcher to watch, but we had um, kids books coming out, whether it was um, Libby Riddles with Danger the Dog Yard Cat, or um, she also has one that's actually more historically accurate to what happened. The cat didn't win, the dogs did, that sort of thing. Um, you know, you had Susan Butcher's book about granite. Um, you had Gary Paulson writing quite a few um, books about it. Uh, there were a few other authors writing about um, dog mushing and dog races. You had Disney doing Iron Will and Snow Dogs and Snow Buddies and all of that. Um, and now you don't have any of that. And we can continue to blame the bad press uh, from the other side of things with the uh, activists, if we want to call them that. Um, but I don't think that that's the only thing. I, I think uh, the imagination is gone because we're not reaching out to that. I did or odds not. They keep saying that they're the number one voice and, you know, they're promoting the sport and doing all of this, but I'm not really seeing that like we used to. Um, and now they're alienating their older fan base that's been with them for 50 years. Um, and so you have a lot of volunteers who said the 50th was their last one. And it wasn't because they're getting too old. It's because they're feeling like they're not being heard and they're not being treated like they were 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, I'm seeing that within my own team. I'm going to be down to even less than bare bones with my volunteer team because many of them are just walking away because they don't feel the Iditarods hearing them anymore. Um, and so you can't grow a fan base if you're hemorrhaging the fan base as it is. And so I think that's where Iditarod needs to focus more attention on. Um, Insider would be a great thing if it wasn't just about the front runners. Uh, they weren't at the picnic. They never are. Uh, I think that they could, even if Greg's out doing other things and Bruce is doing out other things. Clearly, Liz is there. Have Liz grab a camera and a microphone. She knows how to do it. Do it. You know, they should be out there. We shouldn't be relying on um, a podcast or even the local media, which the only local media that comes out is KTUU. They do a few interviews. And they look bored the rest of the time that they're at there at the picnic. Um, you know, engage the fans. We have this technology. You're jumping to an idea coin, but you're not even using the technology that most of your fan base is willing to use. So uh, I think that's that's another key thing. I don't think I did a coin is going to save the I did rod. I don't think it's going to tank it either. Um, but I think that along with it, if you really want to be successful, you have to be successful in the other. Uh, avenues. So, Tony, we definitely have to pat ourselves on the back <laughs> because we are definitely part of that uh, that new wave of media. And and we mentioned this uh, during our Iditarod coverage, well over 720,000 downloads of our Iditarod coverage. That is a huge milestone. That's over 500,000 more than we had in 2021. Uh, so, we are definitely talking to 
uh, to the fans, uh, unlike a, a heck of a, I think any other media outlet out there, I don't think anybody right now is talking about Iditarod unless it's a tweet or a Facebook post. Nobody is talking about Iditarod on a podcast on June 28th, to my knowledge. Is that right? Um, I think the only one, the Iditarod works with uh, the education program and they have like Husky talk that happens. And I think they do interviews throughout the summer, but yeah, I don't think there's any like analysis throughout the the year. So we're, we're doing something right. So uh, a couple of quick points before we go, you talked about Tony, that uh, you were going through your grandparents stuff and, and sort of all the perks that they got for their membership and, you know, they would get uh, store discounts and membership cards and certificates and all of that. Um, do you recall, I, I, and I know that that's gone down quite a bit uh, in just the last few years. Do you recall how much that membership costs and what it costs today? You know, I don't know what it costs. And I really, you know, if I uh, had thought about it, I could have grabbed um, one of the uh, original Iditarod Trail annuals where they first started pushing the membership. Um, I know now that for the one that I pay for, uh, for a single membership, it costs me $50 a year. Um, I know that my grandparents were doing the $100 one um, for two. So basically it was the 50, but um, for both of them and, and they got a patch and uh, some other stuff. And of course the card with the, the, um, the discount and, and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure if it was always that amount for them or not. They started uh, their membership. I think their first year was 1987 or 88, I think is what I found so far. So um, if you will, yeah, it's, if it's, you will, Tony, post that picture of that um, of that annual on on uh, on sure. Twitter, and we'll uh, we'll we'll get some uh, feedback from that. So last question <laughs> for you in regard to toward toward the future, whether it's I did a coin or cryptocurrency or memberships or whatever. What are your thoughts? Uh, obviously, they have to raise money. Uh, sponsorships are down. Mm-hmm. We started this show saying that. The economy is the reason for a lot of changes in the sport, potentially the Iditarod picnic uh, because of the increased uh, cost of goods and things, gas and dog food and everything else. Mm -hmm. Uh, If membership is down, if nobody's interested in the cryptocurrency, if sponsorships are down, if sponsorships are leaving for myriad reasons, whether it's uh, bad press or lack of funds or return on investment or whatever, how in the world are they going to raise money uh, if they're struggling so badly in 2022? Uh, it's a good question. It's something that's been discussed for the last few years. I know you and Alex have discussed it. I know that we, all three of us discussed that uh, last year and I was trying to stay very, very positive and I still want to stay very positive. I know I'm kind of grumpy about it tonight, but, and I'll feel bad about it later. <laughs> um, just how I am. Um, I, Danny CV a few years ago when the Iditarod tried to blow up the last time, Danny came up with an idea of getting rid of the money entirely. Um, any monies raised to run the race were to go back into the mushing community, especially those uh, in the villages, which is what the Iditarod started to um, started for. They wanted to preserve the history of the Alaskan Husky, of the Alaskan sled dog. Um, and that happened in the villages. That's where it started. And they wanted to continue that tradition um, through dog racing, which people were getting out of because sprint mushing wasn't doing enough in long distance. It was something new and something exciting and something that they could hopefully um, make financially viable. So they did that, and now we have 50 years of Iditarod, and that's great. Um, but now we're we're kind of falling backwards and falling backwards quickly. Um, and so Danny Seavey proposed and got a lot of flack for it from a lot of fans. Um, but he proposed that, you know, if you want to make it a race, fine, but there's no prize money for the winners. 
um, all of that money goes back into the logistics of the race and most of it goes back into the villages to promote dog mushing uh, for those communities and those traditions. Um, I don't know that that's also a, a viable option, um, but I think that would change and control the narrative, as I did Rod keeps saying, um, of where, you know, it, it totally takes the argument of we're only in, the, in this for the money. Um, which we all know as fans and as mushers, we know that there's no money in dog mushing. It just goes right back into the dogs. Um, you know, nobody's getting rich off of this unless they can funnel it into a side business like we see with the thieves and the boozers and the kings and the butchers where they all go and, and they make their little tours, uh, you know, they make their money off the tourists. Um, I, it, I don't, I don't know that we will ever see the giant purses of the 90s and the early 2000s again. Um, I don't know that our economy can support that in, in any niche sport, whether it's dog mushing or, or something else. Um, but I think where Iditarod will really need to focus on their, um, their fundraising is they need to be more transparent about things. They need to start listening to the concerns and the wants of the fan base, both new and old. Um, I, I love that Rob's trying to find other ways to funnel money into the race. Um, but part of that is keeping the imagination and inspiration alive. And, and so I think they need to focus a little more on that than just chasing the dollar. Two replies to that, Tony. Uh, you had mentioned earlier in the episode that Thomas Warner, uh, past I did rod mm-hmm. champion, uh, lives in Norway, uh, and you said that uh, they are rock stars over there. They, It's like the Olympics. They are. And uh, a friend of mine, KP, uh, Karosh Parto, and I uh, do another show called The Dog Driver, which is all sprint mushing, and we talk to all those guys over in Norway, Finland, Sweden, uh, mm-hmm. Europe, everywhere. And they, they say uh, most of the big races over there are not purse-driven. Uh, they mm-hmm. they do not receive a purse for these huge events, and and I know that Thomas has won or participated in many of those. So at least uh, on the other side of the world, that's how they're doing it. Is is they don't mm-hmm. have those huge purses. And another point to make is I, I know that sprint mushing is a entirely different animal, but we my business mm-hmm. Alaska Dog Works. Uh, sponsors the the dryland races here at the Chugach Dog Mushers Association, the only dryland race in Alaska, and it's called the Alaska Dog Works Dryland Derby, and we put up the money for that. And one of the things that the club does is we are allowed to say where that money goes. Is it going to go for the purse? Is mm-hmm. it going to go back into the club? Will it go back into in the community or whatever. And up until recently, it's all gone to the purse just because we want to have a draw of people coming down from Fairbanks right. and, of course, folks from Canada and everything else coming over to to hopefully win some money for the race. But at least it's an option where we can say our money is going to go here, wherever that is. And I like you mm-hmm. said, I don't know if it's an option for Iditarod, uh, but we've talked about this many times. If you're not in the top 20, you're not winning any money anyway. You're going to get your $1,049. Right. So a, a, a good portion of the field is not taking home a check for doing Iditarod. And even those, right. you know, those 10 spot, 10 through 20 are not getting a heck of a lot. I mean, it's a thousand right. or a couple thousand or more. Of course, the top five are, are getting decent money, but it's not enough to support a kennel on. So yeah, I don't know the um, the uh, the answer to this. I like I said, I don't know if it's membership or sponsorship or cryptocurrency or uh, what. I have no idea. But I don't think, like you said, I don't think that um, you know the the folks that are that are the diehard fans right now, if they're only paying fifty dollars a, a year to be those diehard fans, and of course. Some of those guys pay the uh, the um, insider, but most of them don't. I would suspect mm-hmm. you definitely cannot continue a a million or multi million dollar event just by those fifty dollar donations, can you? 
No, you can't. And, you know, Insider likes to pride themselves on being the the main uh, draw of money from the fans. And that's great and all. But again, you got to listen to the fans. And I know that there are a lot of people upset about um, not getting the coverage that they want. And a lot of that is because people don't understand the logistics of Alaska. And I get that. And I know that Greg gets really frustrated that people don't understand that. Um, and I think that he's, he's starting to listen a little bit um, because we do now have Liz Thaler out there and she's following the back of the pack, which is something that we haven't had in a good long while. Um, you know, we're getting the live feeds a lot more out there. Um, not just of the top teams, you know, they did leapfrog. They had another crew, one more crew than they normally do. So I think they're going in the right direction, but that's not, that's also not going to get you, um, financially secure because at some point, you know, you, you're tapping out your fan base. You've got to grow this fan base and you can't just do it by doing the glitzy, glammy stuff that that's trending today, but may not trend in two years. Um, so I, yeah, there, there's so many pieces to the puzzle, and I don't think there is one answer. Um, I, I think that, you know, maybe we're being, maybe I'm being a little too harsh, um, but I just know from what I was hearing uh, over the weekend that there are a lot of people that are frustrated that they miss some of the, the old school stuff. They They also kind of miss that you know there are opportunities not just bitcoin but other opportunities in the digital age that they don't feel uh, Iditarod is capitalizing on so um it's it's a big thing we're not in the back room uh where they're all making these decisions so we don't know it'll be interesting i hope to be able to listen in on the zoom it's happening in the middle of the work day for Alaskans. I don't understand that either. <laughs> like pick a Saturday guys, <laughs> let right. us all come and, and be a part of it. Um, so it, it's like right smack dab in the middle of my work day. I'm debating if I'm going to take time off uh, or if I'm just going to hope and pray that, you know, work is slow that day and I can at least watch the zoom, maybe not participate in it, but watch it from my work computer. Um, so I'm hoping that I can, can be involved in that. I, I try to, uh, every year. Um, I do like that they're doing zoom now. It used to be, like I said, it used to be before the picnic. Um, it was like at nine o'clock in the morning or even earlier than that, I think, um, where they'd have this meeting and then it would go into the musher signups and the, the, uh, the picnic and being from Kenai, there's no way, unless I came up the day before rented a hotel room you know, there was no way that I was going to make it to the meeting. So I missed a lot of information and I had to get it third and fourth hand from other people with their version of what was said. Um, so it's, it's nice that they have the zoom. I, I said that, uh, during the volunteer meeting this year too, I was like, you know, this really helps those of us that cannot be an anchorage for these meetings. It's really nice that you're doing zoom. And I, I really do hope that they continue that so that, Again, they engage more of their base that they've had for years that haven't always been able to make it to these things. Um, so in that way, I, I'm glad for COVID, I guess, because it's the only reason they even know about Zoom or any of us know about Zoom. So, Well, Tony, you are our boots on the ground for, for this uh, breaking <laughs> news. So, so we will I'm so grumpy tonight. <laughs> hey, we, 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 will, we, will have, we will have a show right after... The Zoom meeting. I, I didn't even know about Zoom meetings for, for Iditarod, but I'm not a member. I, I, I'm not cool like that, like you are. So we'll definitely do that in August. So, Tony, let's let's turn it to uh, to the to the fans. Let's ask them before we go. What are your guys' thoughts on this? Let us know on socials. You always do, especially on Twitter. What are your thoughts on uh, the picnic, uh, the Iditacoin, the NFTs, the membership? The raisings of fun, the raisings of funds, the future of the sport. Let us know, and uh, we'll definitely continue the conversation. It's been a long one, Tony. Well over an hour. Anything before we go? <laughs> uh, well, I asked this on Twitter, but I'll ask you again. If the race was run today with the twenty-one names on the roster, who do you have winning? Oh boy! Well, you said uh, I responded to that, and you said that you're superstitious, so I'm going to call you out on it as well. Uh, but I, 
<laughs> I I think I think right now it's either, and this is what I said on my reply. I think it will be either Jesse Holmes or Brent Sass if if nobody else signs up, and and that's a, a very far stretch. I think that there will be quite a few more people mm-hmm. that sign up, and remember. Uh, they have until November 30th to, to sign up and uh, not pay a late fee. So those are my two. Uh, I, I'm pretty even on both of those. Who are Who is you? Uh, you know, I think Brent Sass is, is probably the shoe-in if it was run today, um, especially if, you know, nobody signs up and we're here in March and it's the same 21. I think Brent's pretty much the, the front runner, especially since he'll probably – run um, at least one of the quest races right before uh, I did a rod like he did this last year, um, which since it's not in a thousand mile race, uh, it'll help keep his dog's uh, metabolism where it needs to be in prime condition. So they won't actually have to warm up as much as some of the other teams. They'll just freight train through like they did this last year. And then I'm, I hate to jinx him. Please don't let this be a jinx, but I think Dan Caduce, you know, he had such a fantastic run this year. Um, you know, especially if it's a small roster, I think he's right up there again, too. All right, guys. So it is June 28th. There is 248 days, 14 hours, 57 minutes, 39 <laughs> seconds. And the preseason picks are Eight, in. Seven, it's either Brent Sass or <laughs> Jesse Holmes for me or Brent Sass or Dan Caduce by Tony. So we're going to come back to this in uh, in February and March and see where we stand. But, uh, you know, they do this in the NFL. There's always preseason picks yeah. for the Super Bowl. So uh, just because you're a fan of a team doesn't necessarily mean the team is going to go to the Super Bowl every year. So let's see what yeah. happens as, as we work our way through. So on that note, we'll definitely uh, <laughs> take this long show to a close. Uh, On behalf of my co-host, this is Robert for Mushing Radio. We will see you guys next time. Goodbye. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forto and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com.